Welcome to Beyond Sunday School. We are glad to have you with us this week. Uh, We are continuing our series on the uh, background of the New Testament. Tonight we are looking at uh, the New Testament text and uh, kind of how how we got it and all that good stuff. So that's that's what we're looking at this evening. So uh, you may hear some voices as we as we go through this evening. That's because we record this live on Wednesday nights at seven o'clock. Uh, you can get that link by visiting my Facebook page at uh, facebook.com slash Pastor Dan Rose. And uh, that'll be, that goes up every Wednesday afternoon. And so you are welcome to join us at 7 p.m. Wednesday night and uh, be a part of the live recording where you can ask questions and uh, just just be a part of, of the discussion. So as we go through, you may hear questions get asked and realize that you could be a part of that crew that... Uh, that asks questions and, and is a part of the discussion as well. Um, so let me let me pray, and then we will dive in. Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for time uh, to spend together thinking and talking about uh, things of faith and things that matter. And as we learn tonight, I pray that it would help us to study the scriptures so that we might be changed. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Well, hey, uh, as I said, we are looking at the New Testament tonight. We are going to look at uh, the development of the text. Our earlier uh, sessions, we have uh, looked at a lot of the cultural and historical background that I think is, is important and helpful for us. Uh, but as we, as we engage with the text of the New Testament... It's also very helpful to know uh, what it is, where it came from, how we got it, and uh, and that that's that's important stuff too. So uh, that's where we dive in tonight. All right. So uh, first thing we're going to look at is the content of of the New Testament. Uh, and so the New Testament it was written uh, from approximately 50 to 100 CE. So, uh, you know, it was the first Jesus, you know, if Jesus died somewhere around uh, 32 to 33, somewhere in that range, uh, you know, we're we're looking at within about 20 years of, of Jesus's resurrection that uh, the New Testament started being written. So during that that earlier time, uh, you know we we have some uh, we, we need to understand that there's a lot of oral uh, tradition. A lot of much of many of the stories were being passed around uh, just by by people teaching and talking. Uh, but there were also probably uh, quite a number of collected sayings and different things that were being you know, written down uh, to try to remember all that Jesus had taught. And a lot of those things have been lost to history. And so that's why it's important for us to try to think through how was this developed? Where did these, where did these texts come from? So uh, the New Testament is comprised of uh, 27 books. Now, these aren't books in the sense that uh, that we think of books, right? When we think of books, we think of, you know, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 pages with multiple chapters and those kinds of things. The books of the New Testament, uh, most most of which are uh, what we would call epistles or letters. And uh, we'll get into how those break down here in just a moment. Uh, but you also have uh, things like the Gospels or the Book of Revelation, and they come from nine different authors. So you have uh, nine different authors, 27 books uh, that all comprise this New Testament. Probably the earliest the earliest letter we have is most likely Galatians. Uh, it there's, you know, there there's some debate the dating the dating of these of these letters of these texts. Um 
is is notoriously difficult. Uh, but it seems like Galatians uh, is probably the earliest. Uh, the latest New Testament text is likely Revelation, and uh, you know we we are we're more confident in that date uh, than we are with uh, the earlier stuff. So trying to figure all of that out uh, is just it's just tricky, and that's why there's always going to be a lot of a lot of ink spilled on dating, and and why do we sp- spill spill ink on dating? We do so because if we can know when uh, a text was written, it gives us some clues to the cultural environment uh, that that it was written in or that it was written to and the kind of people and the kind of uh, society and questions and issues that they were facing. Uh, and we can draw that information out from extra biblical sources. And, and all of that helps us to interpret the New Testament, because, you know, the reality is we can't sit down with Paul of Tarsus and say, hey, Paul, what did you mean by this? Like, we we can't do that. So the work of interpreting the text, applying the text uh, is (laughs) there's there's a lot of art uh, to that process. And that and that process of interpreting the text has changed over time. We are, in our day and age, way more scientific about it than they were earlier uh, in, in the history of the church. If you go and read the church fathers, some of whom we'll talk a little bit about tonight, what you're going to find is, is an approach called the allegorical approach to interpreting the Bible, where they, as they read the Bible, they were making all kinds of Uh, different connections out into society and culture that in our day and age, we would never approach the text that way because we kind of have this, you know, modern grid that we look through. We want to try to uh, understand the Bible as scientifically as possible. So we're trying to get into the mind of the original authors. And, And that has become the highest value for us. And, uh, and so, and so that's why, you know, understanding, trying to understand these uh, dates and all of that is so is so important to the modern biblical scholar. Um, the is if you think about the Gospels, Mark is is probably the earliest, and it was most likely published around sixty eight. John likely the latest, uh, published in the nineties. Now. Uh, the Gospels are 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 interesting, and uh, these are these texts. <laughs> they when you go to seminary, uh, you spend a lot of time uh, wrestling with the Gospels because of uh, what some people refer to as the synoptic problem, and and that refers to Mark, Matthew, and Luke. So those three Gospels, they. Uh, they have a ton of content in common. So um, it appears that, where and, and, and then John doesn't. John is kind of out here, you know, John's kind of out here on his own doing his very own thing. And, uh, and so, so John, is, John is unique. He's, he's an outlier here as far as the gospel stories go. But he's very important. And... Uh, but for, for a long time now, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke really have dominated the conversation because of this uh, synoptic problem. Uh, and, and so what you have uh, is probably Matthew and Luke using Mark and uh, something in, in a document that's been lost to history called Q. Uh, and and they, that's a German word. That just means uh, sayings or sources, and so everybody just calls it Q, because uh, it's. I think it's, the word is quell in German, um, and uh, and so what scholars think is that Matthew and Luke had access, and Mark all had access to this Q document. Mark wrote first. Mark began circulating. Matthew and Luke, as they were writing their gospels, had Mark and Q, 
and drew from both of those sources um, and potentially other sources as well. Uh, but those two guys were probably writing uh, as contemporaries or, or, or at the very least did not have access to one another's work. Luke is probably the latest gospel. Um, well, of the synoptics, right? John's the latest, but Luke, Luke probably uh, came after Matthew. And so, uh, so you have these you have these very interesting uh, questions because you see a lot of similar content, um, but you have different details, or you have di- and you have different orderings of events, that kind of thing. So, like for instance, in Matthew, this it, you have the Sermon on the Mount. In Luke, you have almost the exact same content as the Sermon on the Mount, except that it took place on a plane. So. Is it a discrepancy? Is that an error? Is that um, a place where uh, you know you have uh, a contradiction? Unlikely. Probably the Sermon on the Mount is a sermon that was the core of Jesus's teaching, and he probably gave that sermon in every town he went into. It's just that Luke's source has Jesus on a plane. Matthew's source has Jesus on a hill. But Jesus probably preached that sermon multiple times. Off, some, some would argue that the Sermon on the Mount is probably the gospel or the good news that, that Jesus preached, that Jesus talked about preaching. The content of that, of that sermon probably shapes, probably was the, the core of, of Jesus's message. So, uh, then we get into the epistles. Now the epistles are, are letters and they're different from the gospels. The gospels, uh, you know, the gospels and acts, uh, fit more in, uh, you know, kind of a historical model a history. Uh, gospels were a very specific type of literature that was written at that time. Uh, most of most of the time, uh, the gospels. Most time, gospels were with regards to emperors or kings or something along that line, um, to you know kind of announce their great military victory and their prowess and that kind of thing. And so, what you have in the gospel writers is these guys co-opting that or subverting that and, and, and making Jesus the center. Of, of these gospel stories, these proclamations of good news about, about Jesus as opposed to the emperor. And then you have, and then you have the epistles, which, which just means letter. And you have four different kinds of, of epistles. You have situational epistles, uh, for example, Romans, Galatians, Colossians, uh, you know, written these would be letters that are are written to churches uh, in a situation for a situational purpose. Uh, you know, Paul or Peter is writing, you know, writing to to somebody uh, to a particular church to a particular congregation, um, and and wants that letter to be to be read uh, to them, and it was addressing some issue or like in the case of Philippians, uh, Paul is writing a thank you letter more so than, than dealing with any particular issues. Uh, so you have, so you have the situational letter, then you have the personal letter. This is, you know, person to person, right? So examples of that are first and second Timothy or Philemon where, uh, Paul is, Paul is writing to a specific person person. And, uh, and he's, he's addressed his letter to, to an individual, not a church. So we have, have that kind of letter. Then you have what are known as the Catholic letters or the, in Catholic here just means universal. So it's addressed to the broader church or to no particular church, but more so to the, just kind of the general body of, of Christ. Uh, so examples of that would be first John or Hebrews. Um, and, uh, and so those kinds of letters, uh, you know, are, 
are are more broad. They're not dealing necessarily with specific issues, uh, but they're but they're a, a broad based letter to to try to uh, teach or shape or form identity of of the broader church. And then you have in the book of Revelation what's known as apocalyptic literature. So the 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 book of Revelation uh, is doing something a little bit different than the other letters, and it's it probably fits closer to maybe uh, what we would think of uh, as some of uh, some of the different prophets, right? As we think maybe of Ezekiel or Daniel, those those kinds of of prophets who are um, unveiling the now, but also the future, and uh, and so there's. There's kind of kind of some of that going on. So so the apocalypse or the unveiling uh, is is the book of Revelation, and it's and it's a very unique uh, piece of literature in the New Testament uh, because it's it's just it is chocked full of imagery and metaphor, and and so many generations have uh, gotten goofy and sideways reading the book of Revelation and trying to make it some literal historical. Uh, future telling thing, um, whereas uh, it, it's probably best uh, understood uh, as primarily metaphor and imagery and illustration, dry, dealing with some very pressing uh, present issues that the church was facing uh, at the time, but also looking toward the future, but not in a not in a future telling kind of way. Um, isn't it interesting though that in Revelation it says that's the only book that have a ble- that gives you a blessing to be studied mm-hmm. to be getting. I that's think right. that's quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is very interesting, and it's, and it just and it just goes to show, right, that uh, even the even the texts that are difficult are you know are worth they're worth studying they're worth putting some effort into. Revelation at the top of that list uh, because I think. You know, Dorothy, to your point, I, th- I think when when rightly understood, um, the blessing from the book of Revelation is so wonderful because it it reminds us that uh, of how deeply God cares for us and how he provides for us and uh, how how he meets us even in some of our hardest and darkest hours. And so uh, the book of Revelation, uh, you know, John was... John, John, saying it's a blessing to read it and study it. Uh, he is, he is right on the money. But boy, is it hard. <laughs> yes, we don't have to agree, but we can each study it in our own way. You know. That's right. That's right. Uh, I was, yeah. No, go ahead. I remember my dad and uh, Janet's grandpa and some of the other ones in our living room. They used to discuss it. They didn't all agree, but they were uh, agreeable about it. And I remember them discussing it over and over and over. Yeah, that's a great line. They didn't always agree, but they were agreeable, which is, uh-huh. boy, we've lost that in our society a little bit, haven't we? Yes. Yeah. Oh, so uh, moving moving forward here, uh, as we as we keep driving on, uh, we're going to look here at the beginnings of the New Testament, the beginnings of the. Um, of this text beginning to be recognized uh, as as scripture, right? So, um, I'm not sure what is going on here. Who's that? I don't know. Says, there we go. No. Oh, that was better. <laughs> I got I got it cleared away. Technical glitch. So, uh, we you know we start. Uh, so we need to start looking at it, it, it how what was the process. Of, of the church beginning to recognize the New Testament as scripture and bringing it on to par with uh, what we refer to as the Old Testament. Uh, because we have to remember that er- in the early church, uh, that the scriptures were what we call the Old Testament. And, um, and, and, and that's, that's really, really important. Those 39 books of the Old Testament uh, are, were the scriptures. And so, 
what happened? What was the process that brought these particular, these 27 particular texts to the fore to, to bring them up to par and on a standard with, with the Old Testament? So uh, first, we begin to see, um, we, we see something happen here in 1 Timothy. Uh, in 1 Timothy 5, verse 18, Paul quotes, uh, has this quote, the laborer is worthy of his hire. The only other place in the Bible that line is found is in Matthew 10.10 10 and Luke 10.7. So Paul here quotes, and he, and he says, as it's written, I mean, this is, he is quoting scripture here in, in 1 Timothy 5.18. And, uh, and he, so he's, he is placing Ma- either Matthew and or Luke uh, in the place of Scripture. So it, it, one of those texts Paul was familiar with. Now, we know that Paul and Luke uh, were tight, that they did ministry together. They traveled together. So most likely he's quoting from Luke's gospel that he recognizes as Scripture. So even near the end of Paul's life, uh, he was recognizing uh, at least, probably at least Luke's gospel as scripture, which is a fascinating thing to think about uh, because Paul was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. This was a guy who took his faith seriously, and he understood Jesus to be the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament. He understood Jesus to, to be the faithful Messiah. And so for him now to, to recognize probably Luke's gospel as scripture, <laughs> that is, that's a, uh, that, that is just a significant development. Um, second thing we see is Peter. In 2 Peter 3, 15 through 16, he places Paul's writing on par with the other scriptures. So Peter, near the end of his life, is accepting, he is accepting Paul's writings as, uh, as scripture. Uh, so it, this is, you begin to see this development begin to happen where they are, or these early apostles are recognizing one another's work as scripture, as the, um, you know, the, the words of God as, as, as words and that are, that are to be set apart, that are to be studied, that are, uh, that are, that are on a, they're a different thing. They're not just guys scribbling notes to each other. They are beginning to recognize one another's labor as, as something akin to the old Testament scriptures. Uh, which is which is profound. Now, uh, the other thing that's that's interesting about this is that the various scriptures uh, grew up in different locations. Uh, mm-hmm. There's there's four major locations that uh, that the scriptures were developed in. First, you have Palestine, Matthew, James, and Hebrews. Uh, that's that's probably the audiences, the focus. Uh, and the location of those of those texts, Matthew of the Gospel writers uh, is most concerned with uh, Jewish issues, so he was he was very clearly writing to a Jewish audience. Uh, James James is writing to a Jewish audience. Hebrews is definitely addressed to a Jewish audience as it's making sense of uh, the Old Testament scriptures in light of the coming and the resurrection of Christ. Uh, and then second location is Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. Uh, this is where we see the Gospel of John, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, First and Second Timothy, Philemon, First and Second Peter, First through Third John, Jude, Revelation. All of those uh, were were developed and either written to or in Asia Minor. So as we as we study those texts, we we need to understand what what was going on in Asia Minor at the time they were written? What were the, you know, what were the issues they were facing? Uh, because those were, that will help us understand the text. Uh, then the next location is Greece. First and second Corinthians, Philippians, first and second Thessalonians, Luke, uh, were probably all written in Greece 
or written, you know, or at the very least written to places in Greece. And then Mark, Acts, and Romans uh, were, were probably written from Rome. Uh, the reason why a lot of people think that Mark was written in Rome is, uh, is because Mark is very closely tied to the Apostle Peter, who uh, you know, clearly went, he, we, we were very confident uh, historically that he went to, uh, that he went to Rome uh, before probably, you know, before Paul did. And so uh, most people think that Mark's gospel uh, in some sense is Peter's memoir, is kind of Peter's remembrance of, of the life of Jesus. And, uh, and it kind of reads that way. You know, when you sit down and you read Mark, uh, the key word is the word immediately. Uh, over and over and over again, uh, that word shows up. Jesus is constantly on the move, constantly moving. It reads like a travel log. You can almost picture in your head, you know, Mark sitting down with with Peter and kind of knowing a little bit about his personality from the Gospels. Uh, you, you know, this kind of hyper guy, you know, recounting, uh, you know, the tales of, of walking and living with Jesus, uh, may, potentially near the end of his life. So, uh, so that's 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 kind of the the locations. Uh, so, so now what about early testimony, right? We have writings of of early church fathers, and uh, these are guys who were who were we would consider to be second generation Christians, but they are writing while the first generation was still alive or near you know, or, or, or near the end of their lives. So, because, you know, every generation overlaps with the previous, right? And so these were, these were second generation Christians in that kind of second tier out from the earliest church, you know, from the, um, from the Pentecostal church uh, that, and not Pentecostal in the sense of our modern day denomination, but Pentecostal church in the sense of the church that was formed on Pentecost, so, uh, you have uh, you have Clement of Rome, uh, and his and he wrote uh, at approximately around ninety five, uh, and in his epistle to the Corinthians, he quotes from Matthew, Luke, Romans, Corinthians, Hebrews, First Timothy, and First Peter. So by ninety five, all those texts were were circulating. And they were present in Rome, and they were understood to be authoritative. So by 95, you have these guys, these texts being, being considered authoritative. Polycarp, uh, in his letter to the Philippians at around 110, he quotes from Philippians and nine other Pauline sources in 1 Peter. Ignatius, in his seven letters, at around, again around 110, he quotes from Matthew, 1 Peter, 1 John, and nine of Paul's epistles. I mean, this to think that these guys are writing as pastors, as bishops, two people, two churches, and they are already, already by a hunt by ninety five, a hundred and ten, they are they have they have in, they have given these texts authority. And they write and they use them uh, as as authoritative texts because really, that's what separates the Bible from other stuff that's written. We understand it to have authority, and and so by one ten you see this happening. Papias, John's disciple, right? Um, uh, in his. He he wrote a he wrote a text called an explanation of the Lord's discourses, so this is this is one of the earliest commentaries, and as John's disciple, who does he quote the most? John. <laughs> so he's he's working he's working with John's text, you know, his John's gospel, um, but he also gives insights into the origins of Matthew and Mark. Uh, then you have this other text floating around. It's called the Didache, and uh, in that we don't exactly know when it was published, uh, somewhere between 80 and 100, 80 and 120. Uh, but in, in this text, you have 
22 quotations from Matthew. You have references to Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Thessalonians, 1 Peter. It's the first place where the gospel is, is, uh, is stated as a written document. So somewhere, somewhere in those 40 years, you know, you have, you have, again, this sense of authority from these texts, but also they are being recognized now as documents that are the documents of the church. There was another document. Again, we don't exactly know when it was published, somewhere between 90 and 120, called the Epistle of Barnabas. It quotes Matthew, John, Acts, Second Peter. And when, it, and when it introduces those quotes, it uses the expression, it is written, which is the expression that is used by Jesus, by Paul, by, uh, you know, by the Bible to refer to the scriptures. That's not just a throwaway phrase. So again, here we are, early, early second century, um, where the scriptures are are given this authority and power. Tatian, uh, an an early early writer in 160, he creates a harmony of the four gospels, uh, which, which is significant, right? So by 160, you have Christian scholars looking at these four gospels and saying, okay, we have four th- we have these four written histories of Jesus. They're all a little bit different. We need to harmonize them. We need to figure out how do these things fit together. That in and of itself is, is pretty amazing. Uh, what is even more uh, interesting is that there was only four. By 160, it was the identification of these four Gospels as the authoritative texts on the life of Jesus uh, is, is really, really important. There were some other, uh, there were some other texts floating around, uh, but these were the four that were considered to be uh, the authoritative texts. Justin Martyr. The first apologist, he writes in 140 CE, and in his and in his apologies or his defense of the faith, he mentions Revelation. He refers to Acts, and he refers to eight epistles. Uh, the way I love this, he, he refers to the Gospels as the memoirs of the apostles, which I think is pretty cool, <laughs> honestly. Um, and uh, and he says that they were read in the church assembly, alternately with the prophets. So, you know, again, here we are by 140 in Christian worship, the gospels are equal with the Old Testament prophets as authoritative as scriptural. Uh, And at the same time, uh, you have uh, a guy named Marcion, uh, who is a heretic. Uh, He, uh, and he created his own canon. His his heresy uh, was kind of this idea of, uh, one we see repeated a lot in, in our day and age on is uh, the trying to deal with the Old Testament God and the New Testament God, and so he gets rid of the Old Testament and he embraces these texts: Luke, Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, First and Second Thessalonians, and Philemon. Those texts he said were authoritative, mostly because they supported his position and his heresy uh, that. You know the church council, uh, you know, nixed nixed him on. Uh, but it's it's interesting again to begin to see that these that these texts are are being embraced uh, as authoritative. Irenaeus, disciple of Polycarp. So here we are, two generations from John. Uh, he was pro, he was a prolific prolific writer, and uh, he lived between one thirty and two hundred. Uh, he quotes almost all of what we know as the New Testament throughout his writings. Uh, the, he refers to um, the New Testament as the gospel and the apostles. And he refers to the Old Testament as the law and the prophets. So you can begin to see now uh, a further development of, of this understanding of these two sets of authoritative texts. And you can see how here with Irenaeus, he is trying to... 
uh, wed these two traditions together, right? So you have the gospel, you know, kind of connecting with the law, and you have the apostles connecting with the prophets. So you, you begin to see these these parallel developments uh, between between these two true traditions. Uh, Tertullian, uh, he lived between 160 and 220. Again, prolific, prolific writer. He has 1,800 quotations from the New Testament books. And he, he is, uh, he's one of the first who refers to uh, what we uses the phrase the New Testament. Uh, so he's, you know, by, by this point, the New Testament is, is the book. It is the focus for, uh, for the church fathers. You know, I mean, here, here we are, I mean, third generation, uh, maybe fourth generation, but everything now is, is circulating around these 27 books in 170. Uh, we discovered, uh, something called the Muratorian fragment and this fragment, dated to 170, has a list of the, of the Christian scriptures, it says. It omits Hebrews, First and Second Peter, James, but it includes something called the Book of Wisdom and the Apocalypse of Peter. We don't, you know, so this is, uh, so that was one early, early list of scriptures. Some other lists that we found. Mid-2nd century uh, is the old Syriac list. It omits James. And what's interesting is these lists are, are more about what they omit uh, than what they include. So you can begin to see what were some of the, the texts that were debated, struggled with, that they questioned. Uh, so the old Syriac list omits James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st through 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. The old Latin list omits Hebrews, James, and Second Peter, and I think you can see uh, in these omissions um, that uh, they were the more Jewish texts in a sense, um, and the old Syriac leaves off, uh, you know, first through third John and Revelation, which were probably older texts or like later later written texts. So you have to wonder uh, how, you know, we, we have that date to the mid second century, you know, was it just that first through third John and revelation weren't circulating uh, in that area? What's, what's happening there. But, but you see pretty consistently Hebrews, James, second Peter uh, were, were things that, that folks struggled with uh, because they were, they are their most Hebrew the most Jewish of the New Testament texts. Origen, uh, who is considered to kind of be the, the first true Christian academic, uh, two-thirds of the entire New Testament can be found in his writing. So if you have Origen's writing, you can, you can put together two-thirds of the New Testament. So he, talk about quoting. Um, and he recognized 20, the same 27 books we have, uh, but he had his doubts about James, 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John. Um, mm. So, you know, it's, it, it, he, didn't, he didn't exclude them. He just had doubts about them. And, uh, and, and we will see that, we will see that theme. The big turning point happens uh, after Constantine arrives on the scene with a guy named Eusebius. Eusebius is the first, uh, his, he's the first Christian historian. He, he wrote uh, the first church history. Uh, he's appointed by Constantine as his religious advisor. And, uh, and so one of the things that Constantine desperately wanted. He wanted peace and unity in his empire. <laughs> and so he knew he was not going to get peace and unity in his empire, uh, you know, unless he could get 
uh, the the Christians uh, on the same page. And at this time, there was uh, what's known as the Arian controversy. There there are all kinds of of issues within the church as they're now struggling deeply with theology and some of the big questions about the Trinity, the divinity and humanity of Christ. I mean, we're talking big, big theological issues and, uh, and constant, and, and these guys were going at it. They were, they were, they were fighting with one another. And so, you know, you have, you have Constantine who's like, all right, yo, we need, <laughs> we need peace. And the way we're going to get peace, let's, let's get, let's make sure everybody's working from the same texts. So he commissions Eusebius to publish and deliver 50 copies of the scriptures to the major cities of the empire. And, uh, and guess what books Eusebius puts in his New Testament scriptures? The 27 <laughs> books that we have in our Bible today. Um, so how did he decide? How did, how did this guy decide uh, what, what was going to go in? Well, first he, he determined that there were uh, what he calls four classes. Uh, you, have, you have texts that he called universal acceptance. Um, and, and so those were, you know, as, as he surveyed uh, the churches and the leaders and things at the time, there, was, there were certain books that everybody agreed on. And, uh, and so those went in, as, and they agreed on them as authoritative. And those went in, no problem, without questions. Then you had what, what he called the disputed texts. Those disputed texts were James, Second Peter, Jude, second and third John, he determined, uh, you know, that those, even those, even though those were disputed, uh, he was not, you know, he, he, he thought they should still be in, in the new Testament. Then you have what he calls spurious texts. These would be, uh, you know, things that were written that, uh, would be useful, important, uh, helpful, but don't rise to the same standard or level of of the other texts. And so some of those spurious texts are things called, like the Acts of Paul, the Shepherd of Hermas, the Apocalypse of Peter, the Epistle of Barnabas, uh, the Didache. Uh, again, important books that quoted Scripture. Right? They, these were these were things that were written. Um, you know, probably in the 200s uh, or, or, or earlier in the case of the Didache and the Epistle of Barnabas. Uh, th- these were early, early, some of these were pretty early texts, but they just, but they were clearly spurs or secondary texts. Um, they weren't primary texts. They didn't have that same kind of authority that, that, the other, that the other ones did. So he didn't include those. And then he had a, a last class. Uh, he called Forgeries of Heretics, the Gospel of Peter, Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Matthias, Acts of Andrew, Acts of John, or some examples. These, these texts were written much later. They were clearly uh, not written by, uh, you know, by who they said they were written by. And they were written... And they're and they're just kind of out there. They're just a little bit crazy or weird, and uh, and so you can kind of you can kind of catch some of this. Like for instance, um, and, and, yeah, they just these were these were just texts that um, that just didn't meet just didn't meet the um, just didn't meet the the standard. So like the gospel of Peter, for instance, was written in the middle of the second century. Uh, it was based on the gospels, but it had, uh, it was written by, uh, guys who held to what's known as the docetic, uh, the docetic heresy. And we can, we'll look at some of those heresies, uh, in, in the next few weeks. The gospel of Thomas was a focus on Jesus's life. Uh, from the fifth to twelfth year, kind of that that silent period, 
And, uh, and it's, you know, it's interesting. It's weird. Uh, the gospel of Thomas makes Jesus into kind of a, a miracle maker doing, you know, teenage boy, adolescent boy kind of things. Um, and, and so it's just a, it's just a strange, it's just a strange deal. Um, so these, you know, these are the acts of John, you know, they were written, uh, at the end of the second century. Uh, and it's, you know, it's just, it's, it's imaginary and contains, you know, uh, just some, just kind of crazy sensuality and, and, uh, and super, super weird stuff. So these, these texts just don't, it just don't, uh, this don't work. The list uh, that Eusebius put together uh, is confirmed at the Council of Carthage in 397. So, you know, by the end of the fourth century, uh, the list is confirmed by by a council, and we are we are on our way. So, uh, that's that's uh, kind of how we got to where we're at with. Uh, with our current New Testament, yes. uh, it's a it's a long history, and oh you know life. it is not clean or simple, um, but that's that's kind of how we got here. That's kind of how we got this this New Testament that that we that we read and study as authoritative. So, can, can I back up and ask a question, please? When was that Council of Carthage? Yeah. Uh, the Council of Carthage was in 397. Okay, thank you. You are welcome. And what's what's interesting is, uh, you know, you had other church fathers like Athanasius, um, uh, who had his list, uh, which was again very similar uh, to to Eusebius's. Um, and uh, there are some there are some differences, but but by and large, these lists were so consistent across the church uh, globally that it that the church the churches by and large had already given authority to these texts and um, and so it just took time for them to be codified and to be canonized so so it was a, it was a good process and um, you know and I think sometimes we I think sometimes we want to almost um, belittle the process thinking that it needed to be some sort of crazy miraculous kind of thing uh but it doesn't have to be that way i i think as we understand the process of how we got the canon and how they you know decided that these texts don't add up and those you know that they don't fit uh, i think for me it gives me a greater sense of that that these texts that we have are authoritative and that they are important uh, and they are the ones that, that we should be focusing our time and study on. Uh, you can, you can go read. I can, I can, if you ever want, I can provide you a list of those, um, you know, the, the forgeries of heretics and you can, you can go check them out and you can go read them for yourself. And I think, I think anyone who is honest is, is that is intellectually honest with themselves sees the difference. I, I don't, you know, there's there's been this huge rise in popularity of the Gospel of Thomas because of the Da Vinci Code, but I think when you sit down and read the Gospel of Thomas, you see something that just is it's it is just not the same as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It just doesn't rise to the occasion. Um, it's a it's a different beast altogether. It's kind of a you know to to try to make a, a parallel um, or an illustration. I think you could say the Gospel of Thomas is like a comic book compared to the Gospels being like a, a high-level science fiction work, right? So not that they're fiction, but if you're if you're trying to think of the quality, right? There's just this this qualitative difference. It could be where you could say the Gospel of Thomas is is a dime store romance novel, whereas um, the Gospels are, you know. Dostoevsky or Tolstoy, <laughs> you know, just this, there's just such a qualitative difference between them. And it just becomes very easy once you set them next to each other to go, yeah, these, these don't, <laughs> these don't add up. So do you have any other, any other questions? Uh, 
I I have just one question. Yeah. Where you said that the disputed books were James, Second Peter, Jude, and two through John. So what exactly did that mean? They weren't sure, but they eventually did get accepted then, right? Yeah. So so the when when he looked at the disputed letters, these would be the texts that were not universally included in the church lists of of texts. So okay. he 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 kind of um, you know canvassed the the big the big cities, the big, the large churches and said, okay, what texts are you using? And, uh, you know, just to kind of simplify it, right. He's just says, Hey, what, what's your list? What are your authoritative texts? And other than James, second Peter, Jude, second and third John, everybody had the same list. Those, those, you know, what, two, three, five books were the only ones that were not included on every list. Um, now was some there something, in, was there something in those books that they disagreed with? Yeah, I mean the, I mean shoot, even Martin Luther. I mean Martin Luther, he 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 didn't think James should be in the Bible. Well, I knew that. You know, um, yeah. and a lot of it is because uh, they're very one, they're very Jewish, um, and so you know you're getting you're starting to get uh, this anti-Semitic strain beginning to run through uh, Christianity, uh, beginning to develop. Um, and uh, I mean, in second and third John, they're short. They're very, very short and uh, and they're very personal. And so it's so there was some question you know about, wow, you have this very personal letter. Um, is that is that really scripture? you know? Or is this just something that we're holding on to because, you know, it was it's a it's a bit that we have that we have from from John, and and so I think I think that was part of it, um, and I think I think the other part uh, with with one of the which one was it, um, yeah, and I, and I think the problem with uh, with Second John. Is that uh, it's it's a letter from John to a woman. <laughs> so uh, you know, I, I think I think that that was problematic to to some of those churches as they began to seek to establish a greater sense of a patriarchy um, that was largely absent from from quite a bit of the early church. So uh, in Jude, Jude is super weird. I mean, you read through Jude and you get, you get some crazy stuff, right? So. Well, was Jude Jesus' brother? James was, but I couldn't remember. Was Jude a brother of Jesus? I believe, I believe he, I believe he was. I, I, I don't know for sure. I just wondered. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think, I, heard it. I think that's right. Um, but I, off the, Sadly, off the top of my head, I'm not entirely 100% yeah, but, sure, but I, I think so. so. I just wonder why they would deny the brother of Jesus, you know, that's kind of strange. Yep. yep, well, you know, you go and read Jude, and it's just weird, and you read James, and James and Paul, you know, I mean, it's... There was, there was a big struggle with James because of his emphasis on right living. And so there was a lot of thought in the early church that James, um, that James was moving away from a gospel of grace to a gospel of works. Okay. And okay. So, but yeah. you know, as as we as we learned uh, when we went through James together, uh, that you know that's not not really not really the case when you do a careful reading of James, right? Um, so. Did so, you have to read a lot of this stuff like? Um, Clement of Rome and Polycarp and Ter Tertullian. Did you have to read that stuff in seminary? No, no, I, I did not. <laughs> I did <scary>. not. <laughs> nope, nope. It was uh, those were those. It's it, it's it, when you're doing the church history stuff, it's helpful because you kind of you catch the highlights and you don't have to read don't have to read all of it, which is yeah. which is good. But those those guys cast some huge huge shadows. That is for sure. So I, I have one more question about the disputed books. Yeah. <clears throat> so Eusebius made the list, right? Yeah. He kind of made Fine. what, what becomes the, the canonical, the official canonical list. Okay. Yeah. So, so did he just 
kind of listen to everybody and make a decision himself or did they vote? <laughs> yeah, no, he, he kind of made the decision himself, right? Because he okay. was he was the he was the official. He was the official from Constantine. Okay. And so um so yeah. So he he was he was kind of the final arbiter of Constantine's uh, published scriptures, yeah. so to speak. After talking to all the other, yeah, after he kind of got the lists and things from everybody else. Okay. Yep. Yep. I I have one more back, more closer to the beginning. Yeah. When you were talking about the epistles, um, and the apoc apocalyptic one being Revelation, and you said that it looks to the future, but not necessarily future telling. Right. So the things that it describes there are not, not like people look at that and read it and or or prophesy that that stuff is going to happen and i'm not making myself very clear but you know what i mean yeah so if i if i understand your question janet what i what i'm i think what i'm hearing you ask is kind of what's the difference between telling the future and future telling it seems like a could it could it possibly be a a, a difference without a distinction or or what's yeah. that what's that that difference. And so, uh, a telling, you know, the telling of the future, uh, is what a lot of people like a Tim LaHaye and, and, um, right. You know, those kinds of guys, uh, try to do where they try to take the, the, the text of revelation and, uh, and try to, uh, create some sort of, uh, understanding of, of the future. Um, where they they are trying to argue that that revelation is telling about very specific future events, and so they try to take um, you know historic you know contemporary time and contemporary events and say, well, see this was this was revelation prophesying or telling the future, and now we're seeing it come to play. The problem is that throughout history. Um, there's there's been movements all all the way through where where people have done that with revelation. <laughs> you yeah. can look at almost every era and say, well, see, this person and that thing fits this. Well, but that's not. And the hard part is when it comes to any kind of prophecy. It it's not it can't it's not going to be something that's going to be a total disconnect from the original audience, and so future telling. Is kind of this pointing towards the future that says this something is going to happen. It's going to kind of be like this. Similarly to say, you know, the prophets uh, prophesying the, their their future telling of the Messiah, right? That there would be a Messiah who would come. You know, who you know, you read through like Isaiah fifty three and the suffering servant. Man, that could have been anybody. It, I mean, there's there's all kinds of things in there that you could have plugged a lot of different probably folks throughout history into, uh, but there was something different about the way Jesus lined up those those things, and so you 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 know you have this it's it's general but specific, but it's not um, it's not this uh, we can absolutely date it kind of thing. So what we see in Revelation is kind of this idea of hey, there's gonna come a time where History is going to culminate where um, heaven and earth are going to come together, where there is going, where we're going to see the final consummation of, of all of it, of, of everything, where all things are going to be set right. And, and, and that day is going to be glorious and beautiful until that day comes. Hang on. Stay strong in your faith. Persevere press on. That's, that's what revelation is doing. So is it future telling? Yeah, because it's pointing us to a glorious future. Is it telling the future and saying, Hey, see, it's t what, what John's saying here is that Russia is this and that and another thing and mm -hmm. Gog and Mega. No, that's he, John had no conception of, <laughs> of modern city state political, you know, eco-political kind of stuff. John, he, he, that just was not, that was not what John was doing. You know, it's, it's like our, um, the contemporary debate or conversation right now about the number 666, right? Um, you know, and, and what's the mark of the beast? Well, when you read 
revelation, you come to find, and you find out that what John's doing here is, is what's known as numerology or Jewish numerology. And that number 666 spells out Nero. And, mm. you know, it was it, Nero's face uh, was on every coin. You couldn't buy or sell things without Nero's face, without the mark of the beast, without the mark of Nero. It didn't. It didn't have anything to do with um, vaccines or <laughs> anything along those lines. You know, th- but but that requires us to understand what John's doing in the Book of Revelation and understanding what kind of literature the Book of Revelation is. That it's an apocalypse, and he even says that. Um, and he places it in that particular genre, which must drive and determine our, you know, our study of it, um, in our in our seeking to understand it. We have to understand it as kind of being this this veiled letter, where we need to do some work to try to understand what are the images and metaphors that would have made sense to the people to whom he's writing, um, to those seven churches. And as that letter goes, it gets more and more metaphorical. It gets more and more image-based. It gets less and less specific, right? That's why those early chapters, uh, specifically the seven, the letters to the seven churches, uh, really are the important. They're, they're super important into understanding what's going on in the rest of, of that text um, because it just gets it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper. So um, yeah. So yeah. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, and I think people really they try to fit everything in nice little packages. Yeah. I guess because it makes them feel better. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, we, we want, we want everything to quote unquote make sense. Right. right? And we want to take things and make them simpler um, so that we can control it. (laughs) So, you know, if, if we really, you know, if we really believe that God is the divine creator and we are the creatures, then we are never going to fully and totally comprehend God. And there are going to be aspects of God that will always be mystery to us. And that is going to be true of the text. You know, there are just, there are just mysteries in it. And we're never going to fully understand. We're never going to fully understand it. Can we, can we truly know something and not fully understand or comprehend something? And the answer is yes, right? Like, I truly know my wife. Do I fully comprehend her? No. Man, it would be boring if I did, right? Um, Do I truly know my kids? Yeah. Do I fully comprehend them? No. And that's, that's, that's human relationships, let alone divine relationships, let alone... This, this text that was written 2,000 years ago <laughs> that was rooted in an oral tradition. Um, uh, you know, there's, we're, we're, never gonna, we're never going to fully, totally, 100% comprehend this. That's why we get to keep studying it and keep learning it. And, and we, can, we can go back to this text and have it hit us in new and fresh ways, um, which I think is why... The writer of Hebrews says that Scripture is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. Um, So, so yeah. Mm. Well, um, thanks for thanks for listening. Thanks for being a part of this week's uh, conversation. Want to remind everybody uh, who's watching this or listening to this later. Uh, you can be a part of a live recording Wednesday nights, 7 p.m. Eastern. And uh, uh, you can get the Zoom link from my Facebook page at facebook.com slash Pastor Dan Rose. I post that Wednesday afternoons. And uh, otherwise, you can reach out to me on any of the social networks, and I can get you this link privately. Uh, but we would love to have you be a part of it so you too can ask questions, be a part of the discussion. And, uh, and until next time... 
love well, my friends.